Hi, this is another vlog from Hey Hey Joe, and today what I want to talk about is the ways that an organization can create an effective trustee board. Uh, there's the parallel video that looks at what an individual trustee can do, but this vlog, vlog is all about uh, what a board can do as a whole. And I'm going to set out four main challenges. Uh, those four challenges start with getting the right trustees. If you don't have the right trustees, it's very hard to have an effective board. Uh, and there are three main mechanisms by which you can get the right kind of trustee. The first is what I call the shoulder mechanism. You go and tap somebody on the shoulder. It's all too favoured in the charity sector. You know somebody, you've got a friend of a friend who might know somebody. The only justification I can see for recruiting somebody through the shoulder mechanism is that you think they won't apply for the ads. You think they've got some specialist skills or are particularly useful to your board. But I would definitely want that mechanism to be in the minority. The second area that I think uh, is a prevalent way is the democratic mechanism. It's the way our parliaments are recruited, it's the way our councils are recruited, uh, and it's the way many boards are recruited because you have a body of members or a body of stakeholders, and from that you get people to stand for election, uh, and from those elections people win. There are huge advantages, there is lots of legitimacy in being elected. I was elected twice to the RSPCA trustee board uh, by standing for election, getting people to nominate me, etc. The downside is you don't necessarily get all that breadth of skills that you want and that you need on a board. Uh, and that's definitely not good. If all the people are from the uh, body of members, they may have all the same skills, all the same mindsets. So it's not healthy to have everyone uh, coming through that way. And the last thing is open and transparent recruitment, where you look for a variety of skills, you tell people what you're looking for, and then they can apply in an open and transparent way. There's a whole range of websites that uh, people can use in order to get uh, people to apply. And on the screen now is the, the blog that I did looking at those websites, trying to see uh, which were good and which were useful and what some of the pitfalls and drawbacks were and what are some of the benefits. So that's challenge number one getting people to be the right people on your board. Challenge number two is how to make full use of all those different people. And that's not as easy as it sounds, because part of the challenge in having a breadth of people with a breadth of things is they may not have much time, uh, they may not know much about the staff and so on. So you've got to have a good induction to start with, but also it's hugely beneficial, I think, to have portfolios. In other words, you link up people on the staff side uh, with people on the uh, trustee side to so say your job is to know what's happening with fundraising or with volunteering or with HR uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's really important because it means when you come to board discussions, somebody can say, oh, I have been talking to the folk in XYZ department and they are telling me this, this is what I think is going on. One of the challenges though overall in my experience with boards is you have what I call a rule, rule of third. The third of trustees will be brilliant, come what may. Uh, and you won't need to do much and they will be proactive and they'll make things happen and they'll be involved and they'll know what's going on. A third of trustees probably will be quite hard to get involved because they're very busy people, uh, because they may have come in for the wrong reasons, they may feel that uh, they've got better things to do having been on the board for a bit, uh, and they'll be hard to get involved. And the middle third is the ones perhaps to work on, where if you give them the right tasks, you ask them in the right way, if you get them involved in a way that's useful, you may be able to get a really good specific a bit of use out of them in doing things. I think it's also important to make sure you ju don't just end up with trustees who come to meetings. If you only come to meetings, you're limited opportunities to do stuff. Uh, and it also means that your life is limited by the number of meetings you go to. Imagine if we said chief executives were, roles were defined by the number of meetings they went to a year. But we do that with, with boards. We say four board meetings a year. Nobody says the X number of ch chief executive meetings. They're probably about 200,000 in total. So it's really important that we don't just see the trustee role as being all about meetings. The third challenge is to make strategic choices. Uh, and that means you need a plan, you need a clarity about where you want, want to go. Typically, this is what people see as the really important uh, part of a, a trustee board's role. In practice, most boards with a minimal number of members of staff, the people who actually create the original strategy are probably staff. And they probably put it to the board and the board discusses it a bit and so on. Uh, and that's inevitable when you have busy staff with other jobs doing other things uh, that the staff will do it. The important thing is that the board just talks about it. The board really knows what it wants as priorities, knows where it's prepared to invest their money. Make sure that it's set that out so that it's coming back on the agenda. So people are saying, OK, we set these as our three priorities. What are we doing? And so I would always have a board agenda, which if you've got three priorities, ask what's happened at every board meeting with those priorities. If you've got five, ask what's happening with those five. 
And here is the challenge between the difference between governance and management. Some people talk as if there's a really clear line between governance and between management. And in my experience, it isn't that clear. It isn't that easy. Partly because, of course, if you think the staff aren't doing quite the level of management that you want them to be doing, then actually you should be delving in. You should be asking more questions. You should be digging a bit deeper. You should be pushing and, uh, and scrutinising and looking for that accountability. So where does governance end and management begin? It's not always clear. The bigger picture is certainly typically about governance and the day-to-day -day operations about management. But there's a grey area in between. Uh, and the board will need to work out with protocols or whatever else it is to make sure that people don't come over that line and get it all wrong. The fourth challenge, in my view, is to make sure that you have all of those different roles that a board needs to do fulfilled in a whole variety of ways. Uh, and those boards can be done by different, um, those, sorry, those roles can be done by different trustees. They don't all be done by one person. And of course, you then try and look at the, sk the skills and, and, and the uh, the experienced sets of people. The first one I would say is that ambassador, the people who go out there, the people who meet volunteers, who meet donors, who meet members of staff, talk to them about what the organisation is doing, talk about the wonders that, that the organisation is up to, generally um, fly the flag for what the organisation is doing. The next one is to be the champion, to be the champion perhaps when it comes to donors, be the champion looking for contacts, getting people to do things, be the champion when it comes out to demonstrating that they are out there volunteering or whatever. The people who are out there leading from the front, as it were. Uh, my next role is to be a critical um, uh, defender when it comes to difficult times. People are out there saying, actually, no, I think we did do a good job. No, we shouldn't do it. But charities will often be attacked either in a very low key way or a very high key way. And trustees' job is to defend that. The most obvious example is about chief executive salaries, but it's also, also can be all manner of, no, uh, no manner of other things to make sure you know what's going on. My next role is the mentor and the counsel to listen to people. When you've got very experienced uh, board members and you've got less experienced staff or you've just got that relationship, that mentor, that counselling relationship can be really important. Have you thought about doing this? What about doing that? Uh, let's talk about a little bit more about these issues. You've often got trustees with a very broad range of experience and skills in lots of organisations and often the staff may have been less. So that counselling can be hugely useful. And that leads neatly on to my next role, which is that of the specialist. We all know you'll have the treasurer specialist, the people who are there uh, making sure that the finances, but also it's good to have HR specialists or fundraising specialists or communication specialists or volunteering specialists, people who really know their eggs so that if you need somebody to give you free consultancy advice, you can use that person to do those kind of things. And indeed, even a government specialist, I think, is hugely useful. My next role is uh, innovation, because often, again, board members have a very big breadth of experience. They may not be pigeonholed in by what a single organisation can do. And so being innovative is really important, too. My last important role, and there are a couple of other smaller ones in the blog that accompanies this. My last other important role is to be a sympathetic ear when things get tough. And that's, for example, uh, things like when you've got the really tough times of COVID or budgets aren't working or people have tried hard to get fundraising to go or whatever else it is. The board can be there to listen to people, to be sympathetic, uh, to uh, give an understanding ear to what is happening in the organisation. When the board talks about that, it's important to understand that people are doing those different things and perhaps to agree in advance whose job it is to do each of these things, where do those skills most fit, who's most able to get out there and talk to staff or who's got the best common skills to do the ambassadorial work or, or, or the uh, external defending and so on. That's it for my blog today. I hope you found it useful. Do go to the Hey Hey Joe website to look for other uh, blogs and vlogs about a whole range of things and particularly our suite of stuff about governance and management. Thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed today and it's been really good to talk to you.